come right over here. I don't think we signed up for this. Hi. Hi. If you can stand right behind that line. Okay. Today, you are going to be running a mile. <laughs> no, 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 we're not. Hey, I did. We'll hold all questions to the end. Here's how we're going to make this fair for you, OK? Remove your shoes and place them in front of you. So go ahead, you can do that right now. You can leave your socks on or not. Oh, no. Great. And now I want each of you to take one big step to your right with the person on the end no. going to the beginning. Oh, right on. Oh, oh man. I got where you were. I got so lucky. This is going to be great. <laughs> I can get oh, both God. of my feet in one of your Guys, shoes. Guys, you don't know what's going to happen. Big guy in the little I'm shoes. Just assuming. You don't know what's going to happen. Can I have your oh. shoes? Oh, please. <laughs> Say hello and get acquainted with your new shoes. And let's go ahead and put those bad boys on. We've got a race to run. Oh my God, I do not like feet. Well, today you're gonna like them. Let me to help you. Now, can we not put your toe in at least? No, it's, okay. it's gonna it's break. Gonna work. I don't appreciate any of Here, those are perfect. <laughs> I don't hate this. So, runners, are you ready? No, we're not ready. Is this the finish line? Are we really running? This is the start line and the finish line. All right, guys, let's get ready. On your mark. Get set, go! Ah, I I slow down. Huh. Coming out of my shoes! I need! How are those loafers? Terrible! Really? They're so sweaty! Do you hate how sweaty and gross they are? I can't stand it between my toes! Other people's feet sweat. It's yucky, huh? Uh, John, you look pretty comfortable! Oh, uh, yeah! Hello? Super! John, you hurt. Is this supposed to happen? I feel bad. Come here. Yeah. Kelly <laughs> took her shoes off. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Y'all are looking great. Side, I'm so sweaty. Man, Carrie's determined to win. She is. She's welcome to win. Come on, Ken. Can't do Let's it. Finish this thing together. Can't do it. All right, almost there. Oh. Okay. Like, these shoes are ruined. I think I'm gonna crawl the finish line. Can't do it. Come on. Thank you, bro. Come on. Thank you, guys. All right, Carrie. Thank you. Hey, we're really excited to have you here. We're going to close out this conversation in your shoes. Uh, this is the third week of the conversation. And to kind of close it out, I'd love to ask a question. I bet all of you would say yes to this. Have you ever been on the wrong side of a well-meaning person? Have you ever been on the, just the, the, the receiving end, the wrong side of a well-meaning person? I mean, they meant well. They were just kind of dumb about their approach or maybe their advice. Like maybe, maybe you were getting parenting advice from a college student. You know, you're like, you know, you, sh you, you really should spank more. You know, you're like, really? You should have been spanked more. I think that would have helped, right? <laughs> or, or, maybe, or maybe you've been married for a long time, and, you know, there's this sweet little newlywed couple, and they've just got all this marriage advice for you. You know, they're six months in, you know, you're just like, oh, you're so sweet. Like, bless your heart. That's what we say in the South, right? Bless your heart. Give it 20 years, right? And then, then, then we'll listen to your advice, right? I mean, they mean well, right? But you're just on the wrong side of the well-meaning person. Um, you know, the worst version of that is, is well-meaning Christians. Getting on the wrong side of a well-meaning Christian, 
way worse than the college student with the parent advice, the newlywed advice. I mean, being on the wrong side of a well-meaning Christian can be destructive. Um, you know what's funny is that uh, even as a pastor, that happens to me a lot still. I get on the wrong side of well-meaning Christians all the time. I, I bet you've been on the wrong side of well-meaning Christians before. Um, man, I could tell you so many stories of how that's happened in my life. My favorite one, and by that I mean my least favorite, was when I was 15. When I was 15, I found myself on the wrong side of a well-meaning associate pastor at a church that we were attending, and it was not my favorite moment, just to say the least. I uh, remember it vividly. Um, I had uh, just recently started dating this unbelievable, like, supermodel who was in high school. She was even more beautiful on the inside than the outside. Guys, you should use that line, by the way. It works every time. And, um, and I married her eventually, Chantel. So I'm dating Chantel very early on. We started dating in 10th grade. We were both 15. Uh, we were church kids. We grew up going to church. You know that about me. I mean, I've been in the church since I was negative nine months old. And so, like, being at church, like, nothing new for me at all. And so on Wednesday night, we had youth group on Wednesday night. I bet some of you grew up going to youth group. And so Wednesday night was our youth group night. And uh, there, were, there were a lot of kids there. It was kind of a big youth group, like 50, 60, you know, students probably. And, you know, like most youth groups, there were kind of two divisions of people. There were the uh, not-so-good kids who were honest about it, and then there were the Christian kids who were also not-so-good kids but just were dishonest about it. You know, they were the hypocritical people and then the honest people. And, and I just liked the honest people better. Like, and I was a really good kid growing up. I mean, this may surprise you, but I was like a really good kid. I didn't do any of the bad stuff. Like, I didn't, you know, drink or chew, or, but I liked to hang around the people who do. Like, I... I just liked them better. They were just honest, you know, and so I always got kind of lumped in. Maybe this has happened to you. I got lumped into the bad kid crowd, even though I was one of the best kids around. I mean, I didn't do any of the bad stuff, but I got lumped in with them, and so with that in mind, I'm standing outside the youth group Wednesday night. Uh, our little service was over, and so we were standing outside, uh, just outside the, the, the youth group room and in, in, in the parking lot area, and we're just in a circle, like probably seven, eight of us, you know, friends. Chantel was there, so my girlfriend, she's there. Uh, I don't remember, but I was probably holding hands with her. I mean, it was very early on, you know, in that relationship, and so, you know, it was that moment where it was like, you're just puppy love, like you're holding hands, you go home, you're like, how was it? You're like, how, how was the night? You're like, I held hands with her, you know, it's that kind of thing. So she didn't feel that way. That's probably how I was feeling, and so we're, we're standing there, I'm holding hands probably, and there's a group of us standing in a circle, and I see out of the corner of my eye, the associate pastor is kind of walking in our direction. Now, I knew him because a few years ago, he baptized me, and so, you know, we didn't have like, a, we weren't best friends or anything, but I mean, I, I knew him, and I assumed he knew me, and so I thought as he was walking up to our group, I thought, well, this is weird, or maybe he's just going to say hello, like maybe he remembers me, or maybe he knows one of the other people in the circle, and so he gets right up to our circle, we're standing there, just 15-year-olds, you know, minding our own business, and, and he looks at me, and he says, son, can you come with me for a minute? Now, I should have known something was wrong, because you don't say son to somebody who isn't your son, by the way, unless something really is wrong, you know, and so I start racking my brain. I'm like, I know I've done something wrong, but what is it, and how does he know about it? That's what I'm wondering as I'm walking, and so I walk away with him, and we move about 10 feet away from the circle. Now, mind you, all my friends are standing there watching me going, this is not good. Something's going to happen. What's going on? You know, what's going on? And so I walk over there. We get about 10 feet away. The pastor turns around, and he, he's real close to me. He's like a close talker, as I remember. Like, I could smell him. It was really gross. And so he's real, he's real close to me, and he looks at me, and he says, son, right in my eyes, son, I saw how close you were standing beside that girl, and I know what you were thinking. This would be a good point to tell you that we all have different spiritual gifts, right? Um, I have the spiritual gift of sarcasm, and so I, uh, <laughs> I, that explains some things for you. I, I've tried to be better, but I didn't want to squelch the spirit, so I just let it go. And um, <laughs> So spiritual gift of sarcasm, I did not have a gift of filtering at all. Zero filter, 15. And so I look back at this guy. I'm so angry, right? I look back at him, and I said, oh, really? Well, do you know what I'm thinking now? And he says, I don't like your attitude. I went, you don't like my attitude? I was like, I don't like the fact that you think you know what I'm thinking. And I walked away. I mean, I just turned around. I didn't even finish the conversation. I just turned around, walked back to my little group of friends. They're all like, what's going on? You know, I walk over there. I grab Chantel's hand in front of him. You know what I wanted to do? I wanted to just grab her face and just make out with her right in front of the guy. <laughs> like, I mean, partially to stick it to that guy and partially because I was 15. I just, all of that <laughs> sounded like a good idea. But, of course, she wasn't going to go for it. So, 
So we got in the car. We had a friend driving us, took us home, you know. I, I get home. I walk in the house. My mom and dad, like always, every Wednesday night, you know, hey, how was youth group? How was church? I was like, it was horrible. I said, and I am never going back to church again. You know, of course, my parents were like, we should talk about that. And so we sat down, you know, in the living room. And my dad, I remember, he said, tell me what happened. And I told him the whole story. And at the end of the story, he looks at me and he goes, okay, you don't have to go back there again if you don't want to. I get it. And you know this as a parent, right? There are some battles worth fighting. There are some battles that just aren't worth. And, and he knew it. I mean, he knew. And, and you know what's so crazy is that I'm 45 now, because it's 30 years ago. For 30 years, I have yet to step foot back on the property of that church. Not a single time. I've never gone back to that church. That's the church our family was attending. I mean, we were like super involved. I've never gone back to that church. In fact, I may have walked away completely from the church at 15 and completely from my faith even at 15 if it weren't for the fact that my, my girlfriend, her, her and her family went to a different church. And, and we were dating, and I don't understand why, but her mom and dad put in a dating rule. I think they probably didn't like me, but we only had six hours a week to be on dates together. Only six hours a week, but church hours didn't count. <laughs> so every time my girlfriend's church was open, we were there. <laughs> every time. I mean, you know, they were like, we have a senior citizen trip to hell, and we're like, we'll go. Like, I mean, you know. <laughs> Because we only had six hours outside of church hours. And, and as silly as that is, I will tell you, that stupid six-hour dating rule might have saved my faith. Because at that other church, I met other people who were so much different, so much nicer, who looked at me and didn't think of me as a category, actually saw me as an individual. And it's what gave me hope again in church, even at 15. It's what gave me hope that maybe I could still kind of be a Christian and not hate all of the other ones around me. Because that was my experience at that other place with those people, with those people. And here's the problem is that with that pastor, he actually, I think, had the best in mind. Like when he walked up and saw me holding hands and, you know, googling eyed the girl, I mean, he probably had the best intentions. Like he probably knew that purity really does pave the way towards, you know, uh, the, to intimacy, that, that if I really wanted to protect what I wanted long term, there were some things I should think about now. I mean, he was probably right about that. And by the way, he was probably right about what I was thinking. I was 15, right? At any point, if you walk up to a 15-year-old boy and say, I know what you're thinking, 90% chance you're right, right? Because 90% of their underdeveloped brain is devoted to one thing and 10% to the rest of the world. I mean, he was probably right, and he probably had the best intentions. It almost drove me away from Jesus. How destructive that can be. If I think back to that moment at 15, that pastor, when he saw me, he didn't see Gavin. He didn't see the person that he had baptized a few years ago. Do you know what he saw? He, he saw those people. He saw those people. He saw those teenagers, right, with their lustful thoughts, those, those teenagers with their underdeveloped frontal lobes making stupid decisions. I mean, <laughs> that's what he saw. He, he just saw a category of people who he had formed a distinct opinion about. And, and before we kind of throw stones at the guy, the pastor, I mean, if we could be honest for a minute, we're just like that guy with other groups of people, or maybe even with that same group of people. I mean, we all have a version of those people, right? Th those people, that group of people who are just almost impossible to love, right? They're, they're all over the roads, not using their blinker. They're in that other political party. They're maybe another generation, like that pastor was with me. Maybe it's a different gender or a different race. I don't know what it is for you, but, but we all have a version of those people. And those people are the worst. And they're really, really difficult to love. They're even difficult to like. It's difficult to even interact with them because they think so differently, wrongly. They behave so differently or wrongly. I mean, everything about them makes them those people to us. And the good news about them is that for the most part, those people stay over there where they belong with their people. And we stay over here where we belong with our people. And as long as those people stay over there, we can stay over here. And the relationship that we have with them, we talked about this last week, is still present and it's still destructive to us. But at least there's a chasm between us. At least we're separated. It's not a, you know, definite, distinct, in-our-face kind of relationship for, for the most part. Because it's true that, that life, life is so much easier when those people just stay over there. 
Like life is so much better when those people stay over there. In fact, we do our best to keep those people over there, or if they kind of get too close to us, we will move away from them. That's exactly what I did. I mean, when that pastor was so offensive to me at 15, I just decided to separate myself from him. I separated myself from the entire church, from the entire group of people. I mean, in a way, he saw me as those people, but you know what I did? I saw him and the entire church as a version of those people. And I just moved away from that category myself because I knew that my life would be better if him and those people could stay over there and I could just stay over here. Here's the problem, though. And this is what I want to talk about today. What do, we, what do we do? What do we do when those people don't stay over there? Like, what do we do when those people become that person? When, when that category ceases to be a group but becomes an individual? And for some of us, that hits really close to home, like really close to home, right? Because oftentimes, those people become that person like in our marriage, I mean, you remember, like, you were dating him, you were dating her, and, and, and you just, I mean, you, love is blind, and in your case, it was, like, super blind, right? And opposites attract, and you just couldn't, you couldn't believe how great she was, how, how great he was. But now it's several years into this relationship, this marriage, and you're looking, uh, no, no elbow, but you're looking across the table, right? You're looking across the home, and you're like, they're, they're one of those people. I didn't know that. Like, I didn't know they were that way politically. I didn't know they thought that way. I didn't know that, that were, they were that kind of person. But they're, they're a part of the, those people. But they're not over there anymore. Like, they're here. They're a that person for me. And it's so, so difficult for you. Or, or, maybe, or maybe it's more about your family. Like, like, they told you, like, when you marry him, you marry the family. And you're like, no, not really, you know. And then three weeks later, you realize what they meant by that. Because that, that guy that you married... His mother still doesn't know he's married. And she still thinks of him as her little baby boy, you know. And you're like, pick up your underwear, dude. I'm not your mom. And he's like, oh, I miss my mom, you know. I mean, <laughs> I mean, when that person, be, you know, that person can be difficult. And, and they're not of those people anymore. They're of that person. And it's really hard. It's really difficult to love that person sometimes. Or, you know what, in our families, this is an even harder one, I think. For our family, think about your children for a minute. Like, your children didn't choose you. Like, you chose that guy. You chose that girl. You chose that other family. Your children didn't choose you, yet they, they, they're with you. And sometimes you did everything you could to raise those kids up the way that you thought they should go, and then they became one of those people themselves. And you don't even know why they would vote that way. Why would they think that way? Why would they act that way? And you're like, this is the wrong way to do it. And you're looking at them, and they're like, nah, I'm one of those people. But they're not over there, are they? They're like in your home still. It's difficult. They're that person. Or maybe our, our neighborhood. Like sometimes those people literally move in beside you. And they cease to be a category. Now they're the group beside you who doesn't cut their grass. There's that person. They're difficult, right? Not only are there weeds infiltrating your yard, their attitude is infiltrating your yard. It's just difficult. Or maybe it's in your workplace. Maybe those people have become that person at work. Maybe it's the person in the office, the cube beside you. Maybe it's the person on the line beside you. Or maybe it's your boss. And it's so frustrating because that person is the one you report to. That's the person you have the annual review with. Like that person is deciding your promotion. And so you're sucking up to them and you hate it. And you hate yourself for doing it. But at the same time, you have a mortgage. It's just so difficult. When those people become that person, it ceases to be a group or a category, doesn't it? It gets real personal real quick. If you're not a Christian, if you're not a Jesus follower, you have some options when it comes to dealing with that person. And in a way, it's almost like a, a fight or flight option. I mean, you can do what I did at 15. You can just separate yourself from that person. I mean, some of you, that explains your divorce, right? I mean, it explains your job changes. You just couldn't deal with that person, and so you just created a chasm. You created a separation, and you put them with their people over there, and you moved on to a different place with your people because that separation helps you. The other option, of course, is to, to fight back. That's what most of us do. When it, when it comes to that person, we love to confront that person. Like, you know, just tell them like it is. Scissor kick them in the throat. I mean, it's, it's helpful, right, to, to just be honest with them, right? That's what you would say, too. You were like, hey, I'm not being mean. I'm just being honest. You know, you're like, really, your honesty is really hateful, but thank you, right? But those are the options as a non-Christian. You can choose either one, and I don't know that either work great, but you have the luxury. Here's the problem. If you're a Jesus follower, 
There's a third option that we've been asked to choose. Jesus gave it to us when he was in the upper room. We talked about this two weeks ago. He, he asked us to do something incredibly empathetic. He wants us to love everyone. And when he said it, he literally meant the those people and even the that person in our life. He didn't kind of take any categories out of the new command. He, he had taken 613 Jewish commands previously and reduced it to two. And now he's in the upper room with the disciples and he reduces it all to one. He says, if you're a Jesus follower, this is what it comes down to. When you're, when you're thinking about your behavior, this is really all I want you to do. He says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And when he said that, he was thinking about every one of the one another's. He didn't separate out categories. He didn't say, except for that person, because they're the worst. I mean, he meant, he meant everybody. In fact, to really try to get this right as a Jesus follower means we have to figure out how to move forward in our relationships with the everyone's, including those people, and even more, that person who's in your life right now. It's a really difficult commandment to follow. In fact, in making it simple, Jesus made it so much more difficult. It may be easier to keep 613 Jewish laws than just keep this one with that person. The good news, though, is when you're thinking about that person, we have a person in the Bible, the Apostle Paul, who's somewhat of an authority on dealing with the, those people and dealing with that person in his life. Paul, if you don't know much about him, let me quickly tell you, he used to be a Pharisee. He was a religious elite in the Jewish community in the first century. Um, he grew up a really good, smart Jewish little boy. He became a religious leader, a Pharisee, and he was so anti-Christianity that he was executing, murdering, arresting Christians, trying to stamp out this new movement of Christianity because if Jesus was actually the Messiah— then everything he had been working for was about to be gone. His wealth, his influence, his power, and he felt like he had too much to lose for Jesus to actually be the one they were looking for. So he was doing everything he could to stamp out Jesus, the movement of Jesus and Christianity, until he met Jesus. And then that road to Damascus, everything changed for him. He switched parties, he switched teams. Instead of being a, a Christian mercenary, he became a Christian missionary. And to think about how many of those people he had, I mean, he was up to his eyeballs in those people because a lot of Christians in the first century didn't trust Paul because, by the way, he was murdering their friends a few weeks ago, right? A lot of people didn't trust him. A lot of people opposed him. Of course, on the other side, he had the team he left, all the Pharisees, the religious leaders. They hated hated Paul. They were constantly arresting him, beating him up. In fact, eventually they executed Paul too. So when we think about a person who was dealing with those people and dealing with even personally that person, Paul is an authority on it because he was up to his eyeballs in it. And when he was writing a letter to these Christians in the city of Colossae, he actually talked about how to move forward with that new commandment that Jesus gave us when you're faced with people who are nothing like you, who don't think like you, who don't behave like you. But there's a lot at stake, Paul thought. So he wanted to give them some advice and give us some advice on how to do it. So here's kind of how he starts the solution. He says, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. He was literally in chains as he wrote some of these letters. Now, the mystery of Christ is really important. This was his message, Paul's message, and it's very simple. I mean, that God loved you so much that he decided to do something on your behalf. In fact, in almost all of the letters that Paul wrote, he summarized the message of Christ. It's what we call the gospel. In, in 1 Corinthians, another letter, here's kind of how he summarized it. He said, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. And here's the, the message, the mystery of Christ right here. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. That's it. That, that's the, the mystery of Christ, that God loves you so much that even though you were born in sin, that you've sinned, you've disobeyed God, you've even disappointed yourself and sinned against your own values. And so we're all sinners. We've all fallen short of God, but God doesn't want you to be separated. So he sent his son, Jesus, to die for you, to take your sin on. Three days later, he brought him back to life to punctuate that sin doesn't reign in the heart of believers. And that's what the message was. That's the mystery 
of Christ, that through belief in that, you are saved from your sin. You're forgiven, even though you don't deserve it, and you can never earn it. That's Paul's message. So he's going all over the Mediterranean rim trying to spread that message that God has done something dramatic in the world. But look back to the way he wrote it. It's so interesting. He says to all the other kind of Christians, will you pray for me as I'm trying to spread this message? Because this message is our message, kind of key, not those people and their message. This is our message, not, not their message, but I really care, this is so cool, about those people. I don't want those people to be separated way over there and me over here and we never interact. No, no, I, I want those people to understand my message. Will you pray for me so that we can close the chasm between me and them? Doesn't that sound different than the way we typically approach those people? See, we struggle so much to love those people over there. But Paul, Paul struggled too. But he desperately wanted to love them. And I think part of us wants to, but we're just kind of afraid to do that, aren't we? Like, why are we so afraid? Why are we so afraid to love people where they are and for who they are? Like, why are we so afraid to love those people, even though they're different than us? There's probably a lot of different reasons. Um, when I think about it, I think there's one key problem that we've all accidentally bought into. Now, I think the issue when it comes to loving people who aren't like us, who don't think the way we think, act the way we act, I think the problem is that we've kind of combined two things as one. We, we think of agreement and acceptance as being the same thing. But agreement and acceptance are not the same thing. We, we live in very polarized times, though. I mean, let's just, for a minute, be honest. I mean, everything in our world is so divisive. Everything is so politicized. Everything has a side one and a side two, an A and a B, and you've got to choose one or the other. And you've got to accept the people on your side and reject the people who aren't. But, but agreement and acceptance are not the same thing. In fact, we can disagree and still accept people. That's a game-changing idea. Paul has this idea. See, agreement, agreement is simply like a means that another person adopts the same perspective as you. That's what agreement is, that we all have the same perspective. So if someone agrees with you, they have your, or they adopt your perspective. But that's not what acceptance is. Acceptance means that we value the person over their perspective. Acceptance means that we value people more than perspectives. And when you think about it, even though we want to lump those two things in together, they're really not the same. Agreement and acceptance are not the same, but acceptance and love are connected. So you can see how difficult it is for us to love other people well if we continue to lump agreement and acceptance in as the same thing. See, Paul understood that they weren't the same thing, which is why Paul learned. Paul learned to accept people where they are, and for who they are. Paul was constantly bumping into people who were not like him. Paul had so many people who didn't agree with him and who he didn't agree with as well. But Paul learned to separate agreement and acceptance so that he could love them really well, where they were, and for who they were. So by separating those two things, he gives us more advice on how to actually move forward with that New Testament command with that person in our life. Here's what he says. He says, be wise then. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. You know, one of the most wise things you can do is separate agreement and acceptance. He says, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Now for him, the outsiders were non-Christians, but for you, it may be the same, or it could be any number of people. It could be a political, those people. It could be any number of those people, but they're outsiders to you. And he says, be wise in the way you act towards them. Make the most of every opportunity with a almost indication that they're not unlimited. Like the opportunities that you have aren't gonna keep happening. Just ask the associate pastor when I was 15. He had an opportunity with me, and it was his last opportunity because of how he handled it. We're not guaranteed an unlimited supply of opportunities, which means we should be really, really wise when we find ourselves with an opportunity. And he says the best way to be wise in that opportunity is to start with conversations, to let your conversation, that's where it starts, 
Now, conversation is such an interesting word. Paul chose it on purpose. And the reason is because most people 2,000 years ago, just like today, would rather go count, uh, like point counterpoint and have confrontation than they would a conversation. But conversations are really critical when it comes to connecting and accepting other people. See, confrontation, confrontations actually create chasms, right? Confrontations create divides. Confrontations separate us from other people. In fact, confrontations feel like rejecting other people. But conversations are different. Conversations actually create connections, which is why Paul used the word. He doesn't want us as Jesus followers to leverage confrontation. He wants us to use something way better than that. He wants us to lean into conversation because conversations create connections with other people, with those people, even with that person who we're struggling to understand, who we're struggling to love. And these conversations have a little bit of a formula to them, actually. Paul used it all the time. He says, let your conversation be always full of grace and seasoned with salt. Salt, another word for truth. Let it always be full of grace and seasoned, sprinkled with truth. That we don't lead with truth, we always lead with grace, and when the opportunity presents itself, we sprinkle in a little bit of truth as the person in the conversation asks for it, as they want to know more. See, grace is so important. Grace seeks to understand, not to be understood. But truth is different, right? Like we confront with truth, but we converse with grace. We confront people with truth, but we converse with people through grace. And if we can lean into conversations that are full of grace and just sprinkled with truth, we position ourselves with that other person to be wise and to make the most of the opportunity In fact, Paul even kind of sums up the statement by saying that if you will do this, if you'll let your conversations be always full of grace and seasoned with salt, you will know how to answer everyone. And you know who's included in everyone? That person, those people. They're a part, they're a part of the everyone. And you know where Paul learned this from? He learned it from the stories of Jesus. Because when you read through the Gospels, the four accounts of the life of Jesus, he was constantly doing this, constantly doing this. I mean, the woman at the well, she's a Samaritan woman, as a Jewish man. The last thing you would ever do is talk to a woman, much less a Samaritan woman. But she shows up to the well while Jesus is there by himself, and Jesus initiates a conversation full of grace with this woman. He begins to interact with her, and he He says, where are you coming from? He knows he's Jesus, right? They have this beautiful conversation. And she tells a lie to him. And he knows he's Jesus. And he says, it is true that you're not married. You've actually been married multiple times. And the man you're living with now isn't your husband. But that's a little sprinkle of truth. Let's talk about grace. In fact, she fell in love with Jesus. She gave her life to Jesus. In fact, she went to her community. And thousands of people came out to interact and learn more about Jesus. Because his conversation was full of grace, seasoned with salt. The woman caught in adultery, same thing. All these men have caught a woman. They bring her with a handful of stones because that's the punishment for her. Jesus looks around and he says, hey, any of you who haven't sinned before, start throwing rocks. Well, the oldest people in the room are smarter. They start dropping their rocks. Eventually, everyone has dropped their rocks. Jesus looks around and he says, where are all your condemners? Conversations full of grace, full of grace. And he says, well, I don't condemn you anymore either. Sprinkle with salt. But I got to tell you, the way you're living right now is destroying your heart and it's hurting everybody around you. I really think you should reconsider. Full of grace, sprinkle with salt. I mean, Zacchaeus, Matthew, we could go on and on and on. Every one of Jesus' interactions seemed to follow the same pattern. And you know why? Jesus understood that conversations create connections. Jesus understood that conversations is what would allow him to connect with people and allow their lives to be changed over time. And if he understood that, and if Paul leveraged it, I wonder if we should consider it too. 
See, if you're not a Jesus follower, you don't have to do any of this, right? I mean, we're so glad you're here. I mean, we hope you get a free lunch or something out of this. I don't know why you're here, but I mean, you don't have to do any of this, right? You're not commanded to do. You haven't agreed to follow Jesus. You can do whatever you want, but you should probably try this anyway. Conversations will create connections for you too. It'll make your marriage probably a lot better. It'll make your relationships with your wife's family better, your husband's family better, with your children better. It'll make your neighborhood interactions better. It'll probably get you promoted at work. You'll be the only one walking around not confronting everybody and talking about people. You'll be the one who everybody wants to talk to because you want to understand them. You want to have conversations with them. It'll just make your life better. But, but really quick, if you're, if you're a Jesus follower, if you are a Christian, this is exactly how that new commandment is lived out day to day. When, when we're trying to love those people or love that person, the only real way for us to do it is to understand that conversations create connections, that conversations that are full of grace and seasoned with salt are the only way to actually move forward and love people well. Because conversations are the most empathetic thing we can do. Conversations allow us to understand where other people are coming from. Conversations allow us to empathize with what they're feeling. It allows us to understand and share in their feelings. Conversations that are full of grace change people's hearts. They've changed the world before. I think it could change the world again. We live in a world that doesn't focus on conversation. We, we live in a world that's so confrontational where everything is polarized. I wonder what it would look like if, if just Christians decided to take that seriously. And instead of fighting and instead of creating separation, what if we created conversation? What if we were willing to listen? What if we were willing to hear where other people are coming from? What their experiences have been like? What their life has looked like? And what if instead of hearing it alone, what if we were able to embrace it with them and to sit in their feelings with them? to see what it's really like to be them. See, I don't think that will just make our life better. I think that has the potential to make our kingdom bigger. And that's the goal anyway. Listen, friends, as a, as a Jesus follower, that's why we're here. We're here for other people to experience their heavenly Father. And point counterpoint is never gonna help that happen because no one has ever been argued into a relationship with Jesus but they have been loved into one. And conversations is where that begins. Full of grace, seasoned with salt. So as you think about the those people that are in your life, as you think about the that person that has infiltrated your life, that's so difficult to love, that's so difficult to get along with, what would it look like for you to lean in, not to confrontation, but to choose a better, more loving path, to lean in to conversation? It's full of grace, seeking to understand, and sprinkled with salt as God gives you an opportunity. I think that's the best mission we could be on. Can we pray together as we end? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to have those people in our life, and thank you that, that those people can become that person, and it's so personal. And I know it would be easier if we didn't have those people, but if we didn't have those people, I don't think we would understand your love for us because we are those people to you. We don't think the way you think. We choose ourselves all the time. We rebel against you all the time. But with that in mind, you don't hold us accountable. You love us anyway, and you engage in a relationship with us. So God, I pray that we will model that for other people. And in modeling it, maybe they'll see you in that model, and maybe they'll understand grace in a new way. And maybe even through our conversations over time, they will become a follower of you too and have a right standing relationship with you, not because they decided to behave differently, but because they believe differently. So God, thank you for the opportunities we have with those people. I pray we will be wise in those opportunities and we will make the most of them. God, we love you. Jesus, we pray all of this in your name. Amen.